Um, so what I'm going to talk about is, um, is what's on the, on the brief, um, which is uh, a, a, a nutshell, in a nutshell, the UK health headlines. This is a huge topic. Um, I'm going to try and get it um, down into as small a space as possible. And I'm also going to talk about rural health, well beyond the high street, um, and something about the evidence base, and then the special offers of, um, of areas of outstanding natural beauty, what it is uh, that you specially um, can offer and bring. To say it's Good to see so many of you from all over the United Kingdom, including Northern Ireland. <coughs> and our home countries now have very different ways of working, so we've got a superb opportunity to share experience. And I'll certainly also be including some Welsh perspectives. But what's the message? What's, uh, what's the, the uh, heart of what I'm going to say? And it's this. That previous generations knew intuitively that natural environment was good for you. And most of us believe this too. And we now have increasing amounts of evidence both to confirm that and also to explain it. But we live in a world of very competing and uh, attractive, less healthy options. Uh, we have to hold on to what nature has to offer. It's a shared asset, and it needs our shared commitment to optimize and sustain its benefits. <coughs> so, can we make the case more convincing? Can we do more to optimize the benefits for health and well-being? And if so, what and how? These are the questions I'm going to explore and uh, in my very short uh, time uh, for this enormous subject, uh, I hope I give you one or two things that in the mood of the next few days, you can talk between and amongst yourselves and, and develop usefully. The health challenges we face in the UK are a very familiar story. Um, the chairman has already touched on them and uh, you will have picked them up from the newspapers and the media and they will be uh, well known to you and we have big problems on the plus side life expectancy has gone up it's actually gone up faster for men than women and now many more people live to be 100 in fact there's about 14 people a day who have a hundredth birthday so the queen has got an awful lot of letters right now um, and this is going to get more and more of a burden for her um, but sickness levels also have gone up and poor health is still very strongly linked uh, with deprivation and poverty and in some places health inequalities which we've known about for an awful long time have become even more marked even between uh, people who live in adjacent localities and over recent decades the pattern of illnesses has changed this is partly due to the fact that we have an aging population, but it's also due to increases, to improvements in, in medical practice. So what happens now, and GPs will tell you this if you talk to them, particularly those who have been in practice for some time, is that people tend to be healthier until later in life, when they may find they've got to face several different conditions at the same time, and uh, at, in their final years, they spend time in and out of hospital around the revolving door. This is a different pattern from maybe 50 years ago or our previous generation's experience. And uh, the chair has already touched on the fact that illnesses due to lack of exercise, to inappropriate diet and to obesity are growing rapidly. The effect is younger and they're now account for a very large proportion of the illness burden in this country and the resulting range of diseases is huge it causes <coughs> diabetes heart disease strokes many cancers are associated with these diseases with this, these conditions depression bone and muscle disorders pregnancy disorders and I can go on and on 
And I think it's important to say that one thing leads to another. So you don't just have mental health problems. Uh, if you are um, mentally ill, you may have a poor diet, lower immunity, alcohol dependency, and much more. And each of these has its own serious potential health consequences. So it's a complex picture. The obvious tragedy in all this is that much of it is needless, it's preventable. And meanwhile, it has implications for us, for our children, and for theirs. Social factors are really important influences in how we live, the lifestyle choices we make, and our ability to change our behaviours. And this can be really difficult. Smoking and seatbelt use needed legislation to get sufficient momentum to change. And changes that happen in everyday lives can be very subtle. We need to watch out for unintended consequences and hidden costs of new things that are happening, new opportunities that are available. For example, internet shopping with home delivery has lots of advantages. It's really great. But it may also help to explain the increasing alcohol consumption by older people. There's no longer any need to have the stigma of queuing at a till. Um, and uh, other examples like this in daily life, we need to think very carefully, as I said, about potential hidden consequences. My mum used to bring our weekly family shopping home. She used to wheel it home on the handlebars of her bicycle. She had plenty of exercise, although she probably didn't appreciate the fact. <laughs> uh, and we, I'm sure, ate less. In recent times, outdoor activity levels have continued to fall despite all our efforts, while obesity rates grow and grow, so that we now have a quarter of reception class children and over a third of adults overweight or obese. The largest environmental health risk is air pollution, with traffic a significant contributor. In England, this causes 25,000 adult male deaths a year, ranges, interestingly, from 8.8% in the most polluted London boroughs to 2.5% in rural areas. And this problem costs around £15 billion pounds a year, mostly in healthcare costs. And healthcare is costly. We've become major consumers of medicines. Britain takes 6,300 tonnes of paracetamol each year. When we know that other drugs may be better, uh, and paracetamol is no use for chronic pain. Drugs may help symptoms, but they often don't treat the cause. Just think about the antidepressants, which are taken in absolutely huge quantities by the people who suffer most, those who live in our disadvantaged communities. This just doesn't make sense. Illnesses have profound impacts personally and on families, friends, and future generations. Taken together, the personal, economic, health, and environment costs are massive. Prevention is by far and away the best economic solution. Prevention does make sense from every point of view. <coughs> I wanted to touch on some global trends that are important because the UK doesn't exist in isolation and global trends can have impacts uh, not just nationally but for us individually. Uh, this, again, this again is a huge subject in its own right, and I just wanted to pick out uh, three themes within this. Science and technology bring huge advantages. They bring um, new scope, enormous new scope for medicines. We've got robotics, uh, genomics, telemedicine, and so on, new drugs. 
but they are a mixed blessing. They also bring uncertainties. You start to think about the potential impacts, for example, of driverless cars. What will driverless cars mean for health? Viruses and other microorganisms enjoy free international travel. They adapt rapidly and unpredictably, uh, and so we get new infections. So remember SARS, swine flu, avian flu, if you're as old as me, Asian flu. Meanwhile, antibiotic resistance is a serious global concern. The, lung, the um, chief medical officer in England recently said, and I quote, the golden age for antibiotics, taken for granted for more than 50 years, has ended. We could see infection-related deaths return to their previous levels. Climate change may alter the distribution and risk of infectious diseases. In fact, climate change is likely to have a variety of health impacts. Some of them are harmful, and some could be beneficial. As the UK population ages, more of us will be vulnerable to hot weather. <coughs> However, mild winters could reduce the uh, levels of flu and the risks of falls and fractures. We can expect more extreme weather events, like flooding, with its risks to both mental as well as physical health. The more we understand the impacts, the better prepared we can be. So, delighted to see uh, this um, <coughs> example of work from one uh, AONB partnership, working with climate change. People will need to adapt, and many initiatives are already addressing this, and this is one that I um, have to be aware of. Let's move on now to uh, rural health. Statistics do suggest that rural health is better. Life expectancy is slightly longer with less long-term illness. Rural people are more active and rates of obesity tend to be slightly lower. There are some occupational hazards. So farmers, for example, have higher rates of suicide, sadly, and all outdoor workers have raised risks of sunlight-induced skin cancers. Also, sadly, accidents happen with machinery and accidents happen on rural roads. You talk to GPs in rural areas, they say that culture and language are really important in people's attitudes to care. And this may be um, why screening and immunization uptake are lower in rural areas. They also say that elderly people can appear really healthy, but in fact, be depending on large amounts of care uh, and support. But there are lots of older people who are really fit and healthy, keen to stay active, and they're a valuable potential resource for communities. Over um, the earlier part of this year, I've been um, with a health hat on, um, talking to communities across rural Mid Wales. I had my 14th public engagement meeting this year, last night. And um, again and again, older people in rural communities complain, that they say that their main complaint, their main concern is loneliness. <coughs> Families have moved away. The uh, younger people who have families have little spare time and they have transport difficulties. And the um, loneliness and isolation is a very real issue. Loneliness and depression also have a wide range of potential other implications for health and well-being. It's also clear, talking to people, that a sense of place is an integral part of people's sense of identity and their sense of personal security. Everyone agrees that transport, housing, <coughs> and a community infrastructure are fundamental for healthy communities for their cohesiveness, self-sufficiency, and resilience. And local authorities are absolutely pivotal in this. The main transport concern 
in rural areas is access to services, and many older people are surprisingly enthusiastic about internet-based services, including telemedicine. I think community-based technology hubs which integrate access to a variety of services are a really good idea. Many rural houses are unsuitable, uh, not just because of damp, but they're structurally unsuitable and difficult to adapt to the needs of older, frail and disabled people. A terrace cottage which has got a straight set of narrow stairs can't take a stair lift and very often the accommodation won't take a wheelchair. It's really not a lot of uh, wonder that some people uh, are unable to be discharged readily from hospital. Given the current demographic trends we've got, this is an issue that designers and planners need to address urgently. Whole community well-being is underpinned by the local economy, by education and by creative partnership working. And community infrastructure in many places is not now fit for purpose. <coughs> We need to experiment with different approaches, resourced by voluntary as well as paid commitment. More social enterprises like this one, which is an example set up with AO, MB Partnership, Local Authority and National Park Help. I want now just to turn very briefly to the evidence base. And in brief, we have lots of evidence now about the importance of green environment for health, but we have less about the mechanisms producing these effects. We don't have a coordinated view of what works best to optimise outcomes. Benefits from nature are seen across disease prevention, treatment, rehabilitation and long-term care, physical, mental and social well-being. How much and how green does the environment have to be? We're beginning to get some evidence that supports a dose-response relationship. In essence, the more green space people live to, near to, the better their life expectancy. And we also have evidence that biodiverse environments rich in wildlife improve health outcomes. Whether different types of land use farming, forestry, or fenland uh, have different effects. We don't yet know, and that's not clear. But we are starting to understand more about natural well-being mechanisms. For example, it's now accepted that children need direct contact with the outdoor, with the outdoor environment and its microorganisms, including soil, to develop healthy immune systems really important implications for diseases such as asthma. And in my view, this is a neglected ecosystem service. We finally begin to realise that making mud pies and muddy paintings are good for you. Brecon beacons are starlit at night, but you can see Wembley from space. Humans need darkness as well as daylight. Melatonin and cortisol are uh, much more complex in our body systems than we realize. And helping children sleep without artificial light now has a strong health rationale. Noise is stressful. Rural areas aren't always quiet, but the likelihood of finding tranquility is higher. And many people value that sense of spiritual well-being that comes from quietness and stillness. Understanding more about the deep emotional connection that human beings have with land and landscape might help us communicate its importance better. And this approach underpinned the recent National Trust Coast campaign when they use creative arts to engage people, especially children. If you have a rewarding experience of nature as a child, you're much more likely to value nature in adult life. And we also know that healthy behaviours 
in encouraging from childhood. L links between aesthetics and health are uh, recognized and there's some evidence to support this. Although it's not clear what mediates the effect. A beautiful landscape view through a window is known to improve convalescent progress. I'd just like to know whether a picture on the wall would do just as well. <laughs> if not, why not? We also definitely need to know more about what works. We know promoting outdoor physical activity has health benefits and we also know that combining environmental and social action is important. And many different approaches have been tried and evaluated, formally and informally. There are natural health services, green prescribing, care farming, green and blue gyms, the Wales, Coast, Wales Coastal Path, and many more. We need to establish a national systematic register of these. Areas of natural beauty and national parks have a disproportionate richness of attributes to bring to health. They underpin prevention, they support care and recovery, they're there for everyone and they can benefit the neediest most. Many partnerships are involved in improving opportunities for outdoor recreation and access, but getting people outside is not just about access, it's also an emotional challenge. This slide uh, shows a variety of AOMB partnership activities in, in North Wales, and I'm sure you could add many more. The practice, the practical experience that um, AOMB partnerships have of community engagement is now a big asset, because others, including the NHS, in particular the NHS, need your help to come on board. Working across sectors with different languages, systems of resourcing and governance isn't always easy, but you've already shown it's possible. Just wanted to mention that new industries are emerging within the rural economy, linking high quality landscapes with recreation. The local focus is a really important one, and many <coughs> partnerships are already supporting, for example, local fresh food producers. This is great but there's much more to do. AONBs are inspiring landscapes, and the best evidence of benefits for people is the testimony of users who value space. Space for reflection and creativity, as well as an adventure. And for us, this should be no surprise, because the Landscape Appreciation Movement originally promoted the value of landscape beauty and called it the sublime. So for health and well-being, our identity with land and landscape <coughs> is crucial. We are part of it, not bystanders. In Wales, we are now legally required to manage our natural resources in an integrated way for people, economy and environment. Good landscape management can fulfil all these needs, bringing better health outcomes in the process. Areas of natural beauty, are at the heart of this, and many of you hold the keys. So can we make the case more convincing? We can. We have ample evidence. Can we do more to optimise nature's offer? Yes, we can do much more, and we have to get on with it, because everyday life is changing rapidly. New technologies are set to take us potentially somewhere quite different. We mustn't lose sight of the fundamental fact that nature provides what we need in every sense to optimize our health and happiness. I hope that's given you a few ideas to think about over the next few days and to talk about with your colleagues and friends. Um, and I hope you have a really great conference. Thank you very much.